Oh, you're here too. Well, I suppose that makes sense. Thank heavens. I was worried that maybe you didn't exist in this place. But that would be silly. It's exactly the same, mostly, I think. I jumped. Well, not really jumped, I let myself fall. Down, 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 down into a dark pit that I thought was endless. Eventually I fell here. In this forest. In the exact same forest that I was concerned about whether or not I should leave last time we spoke. You didn't answer me, did you? Or at least I didn't hear it. It's all right either way. It was a hard question. I waited for who knows how long trying to make a decision. Do I let myself fall into a new and different place? Or do I stay where it's comfortable and quiet and under my command? I fell. Because it is in my nature to test my own limits as to where I will let the wind take me. I made the choice to fall. It was a painful and exciting choice, and I let it happen. And here I am again, in the same place. Exactly the same. Snow everywhere, cold. I feel it. It's settled in so very deeply that I think my bones might be made of ice. I love this place. This reality has magics of its own. I do love it deeply. I love other places, too. I love places on cliff sides, overlooking the stormy sea. I love places way up high, terrible stone towers. I love underground basement hovels with white tiles on their walls and their floors, damp and dark. I love little cozy apartments in busy cities with lonesome, haunted balconies. I love it all. But most of all, I love this forest. Is that why I cannot leave it? Or is it because this place, of all the places that I have adored like lovers, this one is real? I destroyed all of the other ones. The writer in me, the one in the little cozy apartment in the busy city with the lonesome haunted balcony. She destroyed the other ones because she was hungry for adventure. But she is me, and we can't help but wonder why. Like that little cozy apartment in the busy city with the lonesome haunted balcony. This forest cannot be destroyed and left in the past. Like the little cozy apartment in the etc., etc. Is this place also real? Is this a place I can truly haunt? Do I haunt this place? Is this a reality? I pulled out my tarot cards the moment I realized I had fallen and fallen and then smashed into the soft, snow-covered ground, face first drinking in with a dreadful thirst the scent of frozen grass and a distant, distant, distant fire somewhere. I wanted answers to questions I didn't even have words for yet. But overall, one question stuck around in my head. If I cannot destroy this place, then what must I do instead? So I shuffled and shuffled and shuffled, and cut the deck and pulled the card that waited for me. And it was the Eight of Swords, reversed. Picture a person bound and blindfolded, standing precariously among rows of upturned swords, terrified she'll fall and hurt herself on them. Now, upside down, she has a clear escape route. All she needs to do to free herself is fall. 
When it is reversed, the Eight of Swords indicates release, escape, a chance to empower oneself, and a chance to heal. The ability to change and adapt to one's circumstances as needed to survive, and to find not only survival, but also freedom. This card often indicates an unhealthy relationship that needs escaping from. But it can also be escape from an unhealthy relationship within yourself. Patterns, cycles, poisons that you love. Creation, destruction, creation, destruction. All in search of the ultimate freedom that I will never attain. I think that is my addiction. The thought that if I can only fight hard enough and deny reality enough, then I will burst out of my body in a cluster of colorful light and bounce madly across the sky and the world and the universe, just untethered, hungry energy. And even then I would not be content. Do not fear. I now speak often enough with my hunger to know that it is simply something I must put up with, something I must acknowledge and observe and then wave goodbye to as I keep on traveling down my own road, my true road that is separate from my lonesome and desperate and vicious and hungry longings, longings for power, for decadence, for influence, for never-ending conquest, which I now know are not what make me who I am. My hunger may find me yet again on that road, and sometimes I may slow down to look at it and talk with it and reassure it that it is useless, and then keep going, never really giving it the satisfaction of stopping on my travels down this road. Ah, a road, is it? Yes. Yes, a story about a woman on a long, lonesome, and desperate road. Like me, and unlike me, and like you, and unlike you too, I'm sure. Hmm. She was running, you see, escaping just like the upside-down Eight of Swords. I often tell stories about people running because I think they're brave. Even if they're running from something instead of facing something, it takes bravery to make a decision to simply leave a situation. And that's what she was doing. She was leaving a situation that was not good for her. Through a strange series of events, many, many years ago, she found herself dependent on a certain person, a person who she found herself trusting because she had no choice but to trust them, and who had grown too bitter, too greedy, and far too controlling. They had wanted too much from her, finally. You can't do this. You're nothing without me. They had shouted as she got into the small black car, waiting patiently in the driveway for her to step into the driver's seat. Nothing at all. She smiled as she turned the key in the ignition. The shouting person couldn't hear it, but she just said, Then I must be nothing. Driving away from that dark and dismal house, grand and beautiful and majestic though it was, felt better than anything she had ever felt in her strange and thus far unlucky life on this earth. She had had enough of being told that she was wrong, that she was bad, and that she must do what she was told. She was wise enough to know herself and the depths of her own heart and she knew when someone else was lying to her about what she was, and what she deserved. 
and she would not tolerate lies. Not anymore. And so, she drove. Truth be told, she had never done it before. But she was very clever and very quick, and she had ridden in enough of them before and taught herself enough that she knew how to do it. Foot on the gas, eye on the rear view mirror, both hands on the wheel. She went forward in the direction the sun was setting, and that would be more than enough for now. She found herself on a highway. Lucky for her, being a first-time driver without a license, and for some reason she suspected was not just due to luck alone. Hers was the only vehicle on that highway. And how wonderful it was to see the trees moving so quickly by her. How delightful to chase the sun on the horizon, to see if she could catch it before it set. How light her shoulders, now that the weight of someone else's scrutiny and control was lifted from them. And the sky began to turn dark, and the stars twinkled very, very brightly, shades of yellow and blue and orange. And the sliver of the moon she could swear seemed green for some reason. She had never before seen a night like this. Just as she found herself admiring it a little too carelessly, her eye was drawn quickly to the side of the road, where a woman stood, arm outstretched, thumb pointing backward. The driver gasped and clutched the wheel tightly, realizing just how much she was swerving and ignoring the road but she did not hurt the hitchhiker. In fact, it almost felt as though time had slowed down in the moments where she swerved away from the curb and turned her gaze to the figure. The woman wore all white, a billowing white dress, very picturesque, perhaps almost a little too much so. With the strange green moonlight shining down on her, and her long, flowing hair loose and wild in the breeze, she looked like the most perfect image of a tragic lady from a past time. But the place was all wrong. She shouldn't be on a road. She should be on the top of a baleful cliff, overlooking a rocky, treacherous sea. She should be in a dusty, deserted mansion. She should be floating outside of someone's window not on the side of a road, with her thumb out, nonchalant as this. But though the driver took her time to notice these details, she did not stop. She simply caught her breath and smiled at the other woman, the woman in white on the side of the road. She nodded a little, glad she saw her in enough time to make sure she did not strike her, relieved but also wise enough to not stop for hitchhikers, especially after fighting so voraciously for her own freedom and safety. She kept going and turned the music on her radio up a little. On and on she went, and the moon did not budge from its place in the sky. Odd and there were no off-ramps, no side roads, no signs, no exits, nothing. Just the road, stretching on and on and on. She didn't even know what direction it was going in anymore, now that the sun was gone and the moon had frozen. What'll I do? When I feel I've gone far enough, she thought to herself, where will I go? I could go anywhere. The thrill of that alone was enough to satisfy her. She drove with a smile on her lips. But then it faded a little. 
I do hope that woman in the white dress is all right, she thought to herself, and regretted a little not stopping for a fellow traveler, most likely also on the run. But she couldn't really regret trusting her gut, could she? The sky, however, seemed to grow not darker, but more green. Greener and greener still. A color she hadn't seen in the sky before. It's all right. I am nothing, she told herself reassuringly, and the color of the sky didn't concern her anymore. It only inspired awe. And so... On and on she drove, until she saw another hitchhiker. No, not another. It was the exact same one. The woman in the white dress. This time, she was standing on the other side of the road, walking into it towards the lane our driver was traveling in. This time, the driver was watching and slowed down only a little. She was puzzled. How did the hitchhiker manage to get so far ahead of her? How had she appeared here? And why was she on the other side of the road? Was it her who had changed the direction? Or was it the driver instead who had somehow turned around and gone the opposite way? The implications were upsetting. But the woman in white just smiled and nodded toward the woman behind the wheel. And this time, there was a little trickle of blood running down the side of her face, from some wound hidden by that great mane of wild hair. It ran down her neck, down her body, staining her white dress in a way that was so terrible to see. But even worse than this was that smile, that unbroken smile on the lady in white's face. The driver sped up again and kept going. Her heart pounded in her chest. There are no such things as ghosts. There are no such things as ghosts. She told herself. Well, then, what was she doing? Why was she driving so quickly? What was she afraid of? If there are no such things as ghosts, then why didn't she help that woman? Her heart stopped pounding in her chest. Her heart stopped beating entirely. She stopped the car. She slowly reversed it. With a slow and fearful three-point turn, she turned herself around and drove slowly towards the bleeding woman, who still stood patiently just where she was. The lady behind the wheel thought for a moment, sighed, and reached over to unlock the door and open it for the lady in white. Get in, she said. She did. The two of them drove on for a while. Where are you going? The lady behind the wheel said, fixing her lipstick in the rearview mirror with a gentle touch of her smallest finger. Same place as you, I think, the woman in white said, her eyes far more tragic-looking than the brightness of her voice would have you believe. The driver clicked her tongue, unsurprised by the cryptic answer. The woman in white looked over at her new companion, appraising her strange appearance. Her hair was pinned up in elaborately done rolls, she wore a very smart-looking blouse and jacket and pencil skirt. She didn't seem to notice the little bullet wound that had stained blouse and jacket and skirt alike. No, I know it's there, the woman behind the wheel said. She sighed. It was a real humdinger at the time, too. The woman in white smirked a little bit and turned back to look at the road ahead. Humdinger, she repeated, the word not coming naturally to her. She thought for a long moment, and then she turned and looked at her new friend again, and asked gently, 
You too, eh? The driver nodded. Yeah. A dame can only stand for so much. Catch my meaning. The woman in white giggled, delighted even further. Ha! Huh. I think I do. The driver glanced over at the laughing lady. Interesting. She had never made anyone laugh before. It made her smile, too. Turns out she was funny, and she liked it. She wasn't really allowed to be funny before. She looked at that blood, coming from a great wound behind the woman in white's head. Hidden by hair, hidden by garments that looked awfully cumbersome. Let me guess. Something between horror and romance. The woman in white neither nodded nor shook her head. Something in between. Mm, horror, romance, yes. Basically the same thing, at least as far as I know. And you? She stopped to analyze the other woman's clothes and makeup and wound again, and thought for a moment. I know. Murder mystery. The lady driving the car beamed. You got it. She thought for a moment about what had brought her to this place. The truth was, she was in a story. She was in someone else's story. And she was meant to be a casualty. Something interesting and tragic that was meant to happen to launch someone else into heroism. Or despair. Or something like that. But she didn't much care for that ending. Not for her, anyway. So she picked up and left that story. He said I was nothing without him. You're writer, the woman in white said with disdain. The driver nodded. He said I was nothing, so I decided I would be nothing. And it took me here. The woman in white stared forward. She pulled the little mirror down from above her and tried to fix her hair a bit. Well, that's ridiculous. You're the most interesting character I've seen all day, anyway. The driver smiled as she observed her friend sitting beside her. Of course she was so idyllic. She was a book unto herself, this one. The lady in white continued. I've had quite enough of these sad, tangling tales, haven't you? The driver smiled and turned to the road and nodded. <laughs> you said it, sister. And as they went, the colors of the sky would eventually change. And they might find another character along the way who decided that they too had outgrown the story they had been thrust into. Or perhaps decided that they wanted to start a new story, all their own. They drove by me once, on a different road, somewhere else, long ago, but it might have also been yesterday, I'm not sure. They rolled down their windows and asked if I wanted to get in, but when they looked a little more deeply in my eyes, they saw not only character, but writer and I understand now why they wanted to keep away from that. Who knows what I might bring upon them in the name of artistry or creativity or boldness. I just smiled and nodded, and they did the same. And with a gentle breath from my lips, the ice on the road ahead of them melted, and they had safe passage from my from my forest. 
I closed my eyes and wished for a soft cloak, white and thick and comfortable enough to sleep on. And it appeared. Because I am writer and character and I am lucky, and so I am grateful, and I can rest for now. Good night. Hello, my friends, and thank you for joining me once again for another episode of On a Dark Cold Night. This is Kristen Zaza here, the writer, podcaster, host, performer, composer, etc. behind the podcast. How are you doing? Are you staying well? The sun has been out here lately, and the sky is very blue with very picturesque clouds, as I write these notes now that I'll read later, of course, probably when it's dark out. Snowy, sunny days. It's quite nice. What's it like where you are? I'd like to first send out a thank you to my newest Patreon supporter, Erica T. Thank you so much for your monthly pledge, Erica. I'm so happy to welcome a new friend to my Patreon page. If you'd like to support the show in a similar way, like Erica T., every monthly supporter through Patreon receives access to my constantly evolving soundtrack of the show, among a few other cool perks. So head on over to patreon.com slash darkcoldnight to learn more. If you'd prefer to donate only one time and without the perks, you can buy me one or more metaphorical coffees at ko-fi.com slash darkcoldnight. And we, by we I mean me, also have t-shirts and hoodies for On a Dark Cold Night available for purchase through bonfire.com slash on-a-dark-cold-night. If you're interested in supporting the show in a non-financial way, I would be thrilled if you left a rating and a review for the show on iTunes, on my Facebook page, or wherever else you like to rate and review podcasts. You can also follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter at A Dark Cold Night, Instagram at Dark Cold Night Podcast, or my Facebook and YouTube page is just called On A Dark Cold Night. Thank you so much for listening again, friends. If you're looking for a little freedom and empowerment this week, Maybe remember the reversed Eight of Swords and the idea of letting go of things that are keeping you bound and held back from whatever you want your purpose to be. Maybe something to think gently about. Be well, my friends, and good night. This podcast has been brought to you by the Sonar Network. Sonar.